Hello and welcome to 30 on Climate, where you will hear about the latest developments in global climate change. 30 on Climate is a new program offered by the Yale Forum on Climate Change and the Media, a web-based project launched in 2007 to offer original reporting, commentary, and analysis on global climate change. My name is Bruce Lieberman. I'm a writer at the Yale Forum, and I will also be moderating today's talk. The subject today is going to be the challenges of climate change communication, the challenges that scientists, policymakers, and others face when uh, trying to communicate both the risks and consequences of climate change. Joining me are two experts on the subject. They are Richard Alley, a climate scientist at Penn State University, and also Suzanne Mosier, a social science researcher and consultant based in California. Susie and Richard, thanks a lot for joining me today. Hi. Howdy. Glad you could join us. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get started right away um, with a question for Richard. So, Richard, here's a, here's a picture uh, from just a week or so ago. Um, frigid Arctic air uh, weather, as we know, descended over much of North America. A Russian vessel researching global warming in Antarctica got stuck in sea ice. So now, why should the public really believe that global climate change is actually warming? And maybe more to the point, how can climate scientists avoid, you know, playing defense when we hit these bouts of extreme cold? I wish I had an answer. I mean, <laughs> the simple version, as you know, is first of all, climate doesn't make weather go away. And these events were primarily weather. If you had to put a climate spin on these, the, the outbreak of cold, the polar vortex, wasn't quite as cold as the last time or the time before. This particular pattern has warmed a little bit. And if anything, what happened in the Antarctic was also a symbol of warming because it was triggered by a break off of an iceberg. It's primarily a weather story, not a climate story. We've only warmed the world one degree so far and one degree sometimes a record low is set by two or three so it has not even totally made record lows go away. We still have many more record highs than record lows but they haven't completely gone. And so if anyone will sit with us that long, we got it because these actually are consistent with the pattern of warming we expected. The problem is how to get them to sit that long. So the public doesn't really um, generally have an appreciation for the distinction between weather and climate, is that right? I think it's fair to say that we have difficulties with that when people want to use it in easy ways. But you, they know, they know, right? The, the old analogy with the dice. You know, we're playing a dice game. I win. I win again. I win again. You discover I filed the corners off and I weighted them. Okay? I might have won anyway, right? Climate is weighting the dice. And everyone understands that. Susie, um, you've written about an idea that uh, it goes something like this, that many people make the presumption that if you knew what I know, you would think what I think. But that's not really true, and it's not particularly with climate change. And what, why is that? Well, you know what you're pointing out to is actually that um, we think that if if I have a certain set of knowledge, you all, if we share that, that we will all interpret it in the same way. But I think the worst version of what you just said is, if you only knew what I knew, you would do what I think we should do. In other words, we would draw the same conclusion. We have a name for that in the psychological sciences, in the you know communication science. It's called information deficit model. It assumes that your brain is essentially an empty vessel, no knowledge in it, and I need to push pour all the knowledge in it. And if I do that, you will think and value and believe things the way I do, um, which is always funny to me, you know, because there are so many intervening variables between what we think and what we do. So in my case, I know quite a bit about climate change, and I have certain beliefs that make me feel, you know, we should do something about that. Um, but if I don't ever tell you what we should do about it, then how can I expect you to also come to that same conclusion? If I don't share the same values with you, how can I come to the same conclusion? We know, for example, that 
lots of people who call themselves climate deniers or, or skeptics actually know a lot about climate. They just come to completely different conclusions as to what, you know, what is going on. So I think what we need to, one thing we need to get over is that we don't conclude that knowledge results in a clear action. There is a lot in between, you know, our motivations to do something, our ability to do something, our skills, having the opportunities to do something. Um, and we should not expect that people know exactly what those conclusions or what those actions are. In fact, we should talk about those a lot more. You just put out things about talking about the science and the consequences of climate change. I think we need to talk a lot more about what we're going to do about it. So, uh, Richard, um, given uh, that um, uh, a lot of people come to the table with the preconceptions and values and, and perspectives that, um, that color the knowledge that they acquire, uh, what is the climate scientist to do when when confronted with you know not just an empty vessel, not just someone who is completely receptive to the information that you have to give them? I try very hard to find the the way to tell the story that will allow me to have a discussion about the science with the person to whom I'm speaking. There are people in the world that listen to me and say, wow, you're a professor, you must, I should listen to you because you probably know what you're talking about. And there are people in the world who say, you know, I don't trust you, you're one of them. But the physics is the same for me as it is for an admiral, for example. And if me telling the story doesn't work, maybe an admiral telling the story will. So I had the wonderful opportunity to make some television with Jeff Ainstiles and Erna Kugino, and when we got to the point of why this should matter, we switched to an admiral sitting there in his dress whites telling the same story that I would have told. And I think a lot of it is finding the path that allows us to treat the science without making it political. I try very hard never to tell you what to do. I want to show you that the science works and it's real and you can use it. So. Uh Susie and Richard, you two are come to the climate change communication challenge with somewhat different perspectives. Um, uh, Susie, you talked about that, that it's important for us as a society to begin talking about how to respond to the changes that we're seeing. And, and, and Richard, um, I, I think obviously because of your expertise and your background that you really are trying to communicate the what, the what is, what is it that's happening and what are the consequences of how, how these are consequences of the rising levels of CO2 in the global atmosphere. Is that right? Uh, did I get that right for the two of you? I think it's a good characterization even though, you know, what I'm saying is very science-based too, social science-based. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's trying to understand how people work, right? And I think Richard just reflected that, right? He just said, you know, he's finding a framing that works for people and he's trying to find the right messengers for people. Right. And I think it's it's important um, to use those tools that we understand that we know that simply work better um, for the communication of climate change. But what you'll find very often is that it's not, you know, I mean, yes, people in America and in many places of the world don't fully understand the complexities that Richard understands about, you know, the climate system in in broad terms. So Clearly, there is a huge amount of education to be done. But what my experience is um, studying people is that they have only about this much tolerance for it. And then they want to know, okay, this is terrible. I can see why, you know, and I believe what you're saying. You're, you're obviously, you know, onto something here. What are we going to do about it? And what we don't do as scientists, it, it's not about telling people what to do. That would be the wrong approach. People don't like to be manipulated into, you know, thou shalt do this. But what can we do? What are our options? Which of those work better than others? Why do we need you know, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for more greenhouse, uh, for, for the impact of climate change? So we need to do, talk about both of those so that people have a sense we're not just the victims of a terrible thing that we've created and now we go home. We have no place to go home. This is it. It's happening here. Yeah. And there's a there's an intermediate step in that, which is that if we use this knowledge, if we use the what we can do, 
we end up better off. We get a bigger economy, we get more jobs, we get greater national security, we get a cleaner environment, and we're more consistent with the golden rule. Or, if we pretend that scientists are liars, we get a smaller economy, fewer jobs, worse national security, and we screw other people over in a dirty environment. And then it's the what we can do. But the scholarship is very clear on this, that using the knowledge makes us better off. Richard, um, at the annual meeting in December of the American Geophysical Union, uh, the climate scientist Gavin Schmidt gave a talk about how scientists can engage on this issue and, and interact with the general public. And kind of he provided numerous ground rules uh, that scientists can follow to preserve their you know, scientific integrity, uh, their credibility. Are there a handful of rules that, that you tend to follow, just you know, two or three? Yeah, I try to get really careful about making sure that the science is good. I try to be very careful that as I step outside of my area of expertise, I, I make it clear to people I'm not an economist. When I tell you that we are better off, I'm using the results of a huge amount of scholarship as summarized by the National Academy and by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, but I can't personally do the economics. Um, and I do try very, very hard never to tell anyone what to do. Okay. Uh, Richard and Susie, this question is for both of you. Um, and basically, it's about Hollywood. Is, is Hollywood helpful, generally, in trying to ra at least raise awareness about the climate issue? Uh, or is it not so helpful in, in, in general? You know, we had this movie, The Day After Tomorrow. I can't believe it's been a decade already since that movie came out. But it's been 10 years. And, you know, a lot of people laughed that movie off. Um, it, it, it was sensationalistic in a lot of ways, but it also kind of served a purpose to raise awareness. And then, and then we have another uh, program coming uh, in April. Showtime is releasing this documentary, a real celebrity-packed documentary called Years of Living Dangerously. But can we really expect to raise awareness or change anyone's minds through mass media programs like that? Richard, why don't you start? Yeah, so so The Day After Tomorrow was based sort of vaguely, possibly a tiny bit on research that I helped contribute to. Um, I <laughs> laughed through the whole thing. It was, it was you know, the, the heroes were larger than life and the problems were larger than life because it was Hollywood and it, it, there wasn't much science there. Um, I don't know if that did help by by getting people interested or, if, or whether it did harm. Uh, I think this is in Susie's realm. But there certainly is something that we observe in the real world of science is that the uncertainties about what will happen are mostly on the bad side. We have an expectation, if we ignore climate change, it will cause these damages, it will have these costs. And it may be a little better than that, or a little worse than that, or a lot worse than that. But not a lot better, because building Eden takes getting a bunch of things right, not just one thing in the atmosphere. But breaking something we care about can be done with one big hammer. And so the uncertainties tend to be grossly on the bad side. A little better, a little worse, a lot worse. If we have a discussion and we are sane and reasonable, here's the most likely. Couldn't it be better? Sure. Here's the most likely. Couldn't it be better? Sure. If we keep having that discussion over and over again, at some point we have to say it is more likely to be worse. And that is the science, that if we're wrong, it could be a little better, a little worse, or a lot worse. Susie, what's your um, verdict on Hollywood? Well, so on that particular movie, um, there actually was some social science research done that looked at whether or not you know, people went into the movie theaters and you know, got more concerned about climate change. And basically, you know, for about five minutes, they did. Literally. It, it lasted for, you know, a week or something after they saw the movie. And then it went back to whatever the previously held beliefs were because they looked outside the window and it hadn't quite, you know, frozen over yet. So, <laughs> um, it, you know, essentially it didn't do anything, not terribly in the bad way or in the good way. Um, and as Richard was saying, you know, there was no science really in that. <laughs> so people didn't exactly learn anything that they didn't know anything before. At least they once heard, and it made it 
to the screen that there is something like global warming, um, which could have catastrophic consequences, even if it's probably going to look very different than anything you saw in that movie. So, so here, here we have a, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt there, but here we have a documentary, Years of Living Dangerously, yeah. coming out with a lot of star power, and it's not framed as a fictional movie, it's framed yep. as a, as a non-fiction documentary. What do you think about the prospects of that? Yeah, so I think that's a whole different ballgame, right? Talking about a documentary and as that one will do, um, you know, looking at the stories, the experiences people already have, the kinds of challenges it already is causing, you know, that jives with what people are beginning to experience. Not, I mean, look at the record of the last couple of years with the tornadoes, droughts, you know, none of that invented by climate change, right? But people are beginning to connect dots that, things seem to, seem to get worse in their experience. And there's actually some interesting uh, social science research that uh, connected what people say is happening in their backyard to actually looking at the climatological record and see if it jives with that. And in fact, in many instances, people are observing the right thing. They're noticing changes. So as much as we always used to say, oh, you can only experience whether, whether you cannot experience climate change, People are beginning to connect the dots more than maybe some of us scientists would feel comfortable saying, oh yeah, that's all due to climate change. So people are getting that, and I think we have an opportunity to connect from their experience that they're beginning to have with a movie like that or with you know any opportunity we have to in, in public talks or whatever we do, church groups, wherever we get, go and give talks, we have an opportunity to pick them up and say, let me show you how that pattern that you're intuiting how that connects with the global science, and then start the conversation from there about what we're going to do. I have two more questions um, that we put together in advance, and then I'd like to tackle a couple of questions from the public, because we've had some great ones coming from viewers. But uh, Susie, I'd like to follow up with um, a question regarding a report by Yale and George Mason Universities in late 2012. It identified uh, six types of Americans when it comes to their perspectives on climate change, and I'll just list them here. Uh, alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and then uh, dismissive, people who are dismissive. So you've argued in the past that it's important to reach out to the four middle segments, which actually make up about 76% of uh, Americans. So my question is this, what particular challenges do communicators face when they're trying to reach this middle ground, this silent middle as it's called? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and let me just quickly uh, correct that, you know, the Yale uh, uh, project and together with George Mason Climate Change Communications Center, they've been doing that for uh, now four, five years, since 2009, um, and they've tracked mm -hmm. how the six Americas, you know, the proportions of the population that follow fall into these six categories, how sure. they change over time. And what they found, like you just mentioned, is that the ones on the extreme, the alarmed and the dismissive, um, they have changed in proportion quite a bit, but the middle six Ameri the middle of the four Americas of the six have actually been fairly stable over time. And that particular group, um, it's really interesting. They have varying strengths, but not nearly as strong a belief in the existence of climate change. They know less, they care less, they're less actively engaged in it, and they just think, you know, well, I'm sort of holding out until I'm, you know, somebody tells me it's for real, it's really human cause, until all the scientists agree and, you know, I know what to do about it. And so the, the key thing there, and, and, you know, let me just say connected with the earlier point we were making about weather events. If it's a really, really cold winter, then they might actually say, what is all that global warming talk about? You know, they might be most swayed by that. And next summer, it's droughts, wildfire, you know, floods, whatever, and then they're going to be swayed again in the direction of, well, maybe it is happening. So they're, they have the least strongly held beliefs about it, and we need to help them, if you will, turn these, you know, weakly held beliefs into a clear uh, opinion, a clear knowledge. And so when you meet people who are in that middle care category, help them understand that it is real, that it is human caused, that scientists agree on it, and that there is something that can be done about it, and help them see what that is. 
what can we do in the energy sector, in the household, they personally, what communities can do, what states can do, and so on and so forth. So, they, thank you. Thank you, Susie. So, Richard, um, you know, one consequence of the middle not engaging as, as maybe as much as the two extremes is that Washington hears only the extreme points of view, which leads, obviously, as we've seen, to the polarizing politics surrounding climate change. So, you know, how can scientists help um, break through that kind of gridlock and inaction that the extremes of you kind of foster from both right. sides? Yeah, and, and the extremes are so loud. You know, mm -hmm. we, we did a fascinating workshop with some television meteorologists, and uh, one of them was saying, if I try to put something on the air about climate, if three people complain to my station manager, that's a groundswell, and I will be told to shut up. But three. <laughs> um, so, so it is. It is a, often a very small number of voices that's being very, very loud, uh, because we do have such high confidence that there is a social cost of carbon, that burning and letting the CO two go into the air to change the climate costs us. It hurts us. That essentially there is a subsidy being supplied at this point for to encourage fossil fuel use. If people take the scholarship and they use it, they end up better off. And I think that piece of the story, that not just there is something you can do, but there's something that you can do that will help you, is the one that we have not told very well. Okay. Um, this question comes from a woman who lives in Dublin, New Hampshire, and she asks, how can the issue of climate change be delivered to young parents so that they won't become afraid, but instead concerned enough to take action. She had a couple of follow-up questions, but let me ask that. Um, and um, uh, I'd like both of you to kind of take a stab at that one. Susie, if you can start. Sure. It's actually a really difficult question, but I'm not sure it's so different um, for, say, a young parent as it would be for, you know, a grandparent. Um, you know, they care about their their children um, as well and their grandchildren. The issue for me is that I start actually with acknowledging that it is scary. You know, if you really take in the science that Richard um, is such an expert in, if you take that in, it's a scary picture. Um, and I think what's important is that we start from there that we allow people to have those feelings. And that could be anything from you know, grief to anger to guilt to whatever. And maybe sometimes actually a greater engagement because of it. You know, They just really are sick of hearing the partisan bickering. They don't want to be stuck in those and they want to do something. So to me, it's acknowledge the feelings, allow people to give them a clear, uh, you know, a, a safe space to have them and then help them see what authentically what, what we can do that cr creates a authentic hope. And by that I don't mean, oh, you know, if you just turn your light bulb, then everything's going to turn, you know, uh, change your light bulb is going to change. It's the, you're going to solve the problem. We're not going to solve it by something as simple as that. You have to help people see how their actions and give them some clear opportunities, some clear options, how those actions fit into a larger picture of social change. I always say, you know, in addition to teaching climate change, teach social change. Because most people don't know how policy gets made in this country, how anything ever changed in this country environmentally and in politics. Help them see how community action and state actions are uh, related and how that eventually creates a situation where Congress steps in and creates a level playing field and puts in a policy and they look to the leaders and that sort of thing. So we have to help them see how significant change can help and come about. Richard, did you want to add to that? Yeah, it's there's a there's a beautiful vision out there that we actually do now see a way that we can get to a sustainable energy system, that we really can power everyone. We've learned enough about wind, we've learned enough about solar cells. Our history, we move into somewhere and we burn all the trees. Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, where I'm speaking to you from, a hundred years ago they talked about the great Pennsylvania desert. There were no trees left in Pennsylvania, essentially, a few here and there, but essentially we cut everything. We mined the ocean for whales and we burned them all so we could see in the evening. And then 
we switch to something else and now we're burning fossil algae and we're, we're burning fossil trees and that will run out too but we can see a future that actually is sustainable now. We actually can see a way that we can power the developed world and the developing world and it'll work. So there's, there's scary things in here. We can make the world very, very difficult to live in. We can make the tropics hot enough that essentially an unprotected person can't live there. But we can also build a world that's sustainable and will power everyone. And we're the first generation that can really say that, that we can see how to make it work. So there's a, there's a vast opportunity here for really good things. A viewer from um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, your home state, uh, Richard, says that issues related to equity and ethics um, are increasingly central to climate change negotiations. And what is the best way to educate the American public about these ethical dimensions of global climate change internationally? Uh, Susie. That's a really complicated question because, you know, the ethical dimension of this issue are so vast. Um, the, for example, I'll just mention a few of the items that need to be on the table. The, what, what Richard just talked about is a history of Western developed countries essentially growing from, you know, when we burned whale oil uh, to having the kinds of societies that you see outside your window on the basis of fossil fuel. We have grown into that highly developed state from uh, using up the Earth's resources. And right now, there are vast numbers of uh, people in this country who would like to have the same right. But if they do that with the same energy, the same form of energy, fossil fuels, um, we're going to turn this um, planet into a little burnt pretzel. That's not a good way forward. So we need to do that with a different form of energy, wind, solar, geothermal and others um, are the kinds of alternatives that we have. So we have to allow people to develop um, in a way that does not endanger the rest of us um, or all of us, if you will. That's one piece. We have to somehow account for the fact that we already are causing damages around the planet because climate change is here now, real causing impact as we speak. And most of the people who will suffer most from that have done the least to contribute to the problem. So we have to find an answer to that problem. And those are just two of the issues um, that are needed, you know, need to be addressed. I think what I do in my conversations is that I don't need to explain that in great detail. Um, people actually have moral sensitivities that you can uh, tap into. You know, people have an issue or, or values around justice uh, and, and equity and taking care of the least of us. And you can tap into those. So it's, you know, you can embed it in, in tapping into people's values where they're at and I think, you know, have them understand very quickly that this is a pretty complicated issue to deal with. Richard, do you share that sense of optimism? I, I do. Um, some of the dismissives on, on climate change, I believe, are dismissive because of a, a lack of trust in government. Um, on the things that go back historically a long time. But many of them are, are deeply religious people. And when you can sit down and get to the, the, you know, this is physics we've known for 100 years, it's physics that the Air Force worked out so they could put sensors on heat-seeking missiles. Some of these dismissives suddenly say, wait a minute, this is real. And what I do hurts somebody else because the winners now are rich people in cold places and the losers are poor people in hot places and people who haven't been born yet. And a lot of people who care very deeply about others, if you want to get past the you're them and you get to the reality, they suddenly say, wait a minute, this matters and I can do something about it. And Bruce, Richard, can I just quickly add? Yes, please, please do. So the optimism is that you can educate people about it. I don't necessarily have an optimism that we're going to get over our selfishness and, you know, deal with it in an equi equitable way. I think there are ways to do that and better and worse ways to do that. Um, and that is the big challenge that we're facing with climate negotiations at the international and eventually here at the national level. But I just, you know, you asked about can we educate people about that? And yes, absolutely we can. 
because there are some fundamental characteristics of just being a human that you can appeal to yep. to have them empathize, you know, empathy, obviously, and a quality that plays yeah. very strongly into climate change discussions. Yep. Even, you know, some very conservative audiences have very strong values around stewardship um, and, you know, taking care of the least of us, of, of nature and whatnot. And I think those are the kinds of values that we have to tap into um, to bring people around, whether or not they believe, you know, climate change is real or is human cause. You can tap and start from that place to start a conversation about how shall we conduct ourselves, if you will, as humans in this kind of world. Richard, um, I'm going to wrap up with a question for you, and um, it's one that uh, that's been asked a lot uh, on, around climate change, and it's this. Does the scientist hold an ethical duty greater than or the same as any citizen to convey the danger and alarm of what we're facing? related to climate change. Yeah, I think that the scientist holds a duty to convey what we know. Uh, and I, I, do, I personally, yeah, I do. Um, we, if, if you see that I'm about to be in serious danger, if you saw the bookshelf behind me about to fall over, and you didn't warn me, the viewers are going to say, why didn't you tell him? What's wrong with you that you didn't point out what you knew that he didn't see? And, you know, there, there are certain situations where it actually would be criminal for you not to warn me. There are others where it would just be, be wrong for you not to warn me. But I think we really do have a responsibility to tell the people what we've learned. And they will decide what to do with this and where to go with it and what policies to do with it. But personally, I couldn't sleep at night if I, I didn't tell people what we know. And I think as a community, we do. Now, that probably does not mean that every individual scientist has to be out doing this. But as a community, we were paid for in large part by the public. We have to give back to the public what we learned. Okay. Um that's all the time we have today. I really want to thank uh, both Richard and Susie for joining me today. Um, I think we've had a terrific discussion. It's such a huge topic, and I think that we touched upon some very important points, but I also recognize that we could uh, talk about this for a long, long, long time. So I, I really appreciate your time in joining us. Um, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. Yep, thank you. 30 on Climate's next webcast is scheduled for March. It's tentatively scheduled for March 19th at noon Pacific. And the subject then is going to be the longest running record of atmospheric carbon dioxide, what it means to cross the 400 parts per million marker, and as we did last year, and the funding threat uh, that this particular CO2 record faces. Among the guests will be Scripps Institution of Oceanography researcher Ralph Keeling. To find out more about this uh, upcoming webcast and other 30 on Climate webcasts, please sign up to get announcements at the Yale Forum's website. You can also follow the Yale Forum on Facebook and also Twitter. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Enjoyed it. Sorry about the problems. <laughs> <laughs>